Okay, so thank you all for joining us uh, on this uh, panel session on assessment. So starting with assessment. Um, so assessment has been around part of the education system for forever, pretty much. Uh, but it's in recent years that we're starting to see a growing discussion and debate surrounding assessment. And there are many reasons for that. So one reason is, is the fact that uh, there is a growing understanding of the importance of assessment and the uh, benefits that it could bring. Another is technology. Uh, technology could either disrupt or provide opportunities in the assessment space. And there's also growing realization of the uh, social and uh, uh, emotional impact that assessment could have. Uh, so this is just to name a few. Uh, but uh, on this panel, we uh, aim to explore the areas surrounding assessment and hopefully get wiser by doing that. Um, so if you look at the program, uh, you will find that we were meant to be four. Uh, unfortunately, uh, one of our member panelists had an incident yesterday. Luckily, he is better, however, unable to attend today. Nevertheless, we've got a distinguished panel with us here today, very experienced, knowledgeable people, and we look forward to the uh, conversation and to sharing some insights on assessments. My name is uh, Eris Toker, as you can see. Uh, I've been in the education sector for uh, over 20 years uh, in various roles from startups, including one here in China, uh, to managing uh, divisions in large organizations like Kaplan, uh, recently, two and a half years ago, I joined Renaissance, and I'll tell you more about that uh, uh, later on. Uh, on this panel, uh, we will first do the introductions. Following that, we uh, will each do a short presentation explaining how our own companies uh, work in, assess in the ass assessment space. And following that, we will follow up with uh, a Q&A session exploring these issues. And with that, I'd like to hand over to my fellow uh, panelists to present themselves. Uh, would you like to start, David? Sure, I'd love to. So, uh, I am David Williamson. I'm the Vice President of New Product Development at Educational Testing Service. Educational Testing Service is most well known for our uh, flagship programs of the TOEFL, the TOEIC, the GRE, uh, and other things as well. Um, prior to this position at ETS, uh, I uh, was the research director for the Automated Scoring and Cognitive Sciences Division within ETS where we developed um, AI technologies for uh, spoken interaction, for the automated processing of writing, uh, and for the processing of text, uh, simulation-based assessment for both high-stakes and low-stakes assessments, uh, and research in Bayesian networks and other fundamental psychometric methodologies. And it's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, first of all, thank you to Rick and Thomas and the team at Tau for inviting me. It's a real privilege to be here with these real experts. I feel like a bit of an imposter here. Um, I don't really know anything about assessment. Um, but I do run a company that does uh, formative assessment called Zish. And I'll tell you a bit more about Zish in a moment. Um, but my claim to fame is that I was Google's first product manager hired outside the United States. And I helped build um, the first version of Android when it was still a secret project. So if you're using... Um, an Android device, then maybe I had a small part in, in, in developing that. Um, but that's me. Thank you. Um, and um, following that, thank you for the introductions. We, uh, shall we start with the uh, presentations? Uh, David, would you like to go first? Sure, thank you very much. So um, I decided to start with a couple of things here. We're, we're going to open with just a few opening thoughts. Uh, and you know, I chose to, to redirect my opening thoughts so that it's less about ETS and more about my own personal view on where I see uh, opportunity and, and issues in uh, the intersection of education and testing. And hopefully that will set the stage for uh, an interesting discussion that we can have among the panel uh, and hopefully it'll provide some things that uh, you as the audience might appreciate as well. And one of the things that strikes all of us, I think, is that when we talk about tests and learning, they're really very separate activities, despite the fact that they seem to be fundamentally around the same kind of things, and that's knowledge, knowledge acquisition, uh, and how you apply it. Um, there really is a great divide between tests and learning. And there's some very real reasons why this is the case. Um, with tests, the purpose is often, at least for high-stakes tests, 
uh, a gateway to opportunity where people use scores to make decisions about you. You can get opportunity or lose opportunities as a result of these kinds of events. So they're consequential, they're single events, and your goal as an examinee is to demonstrate as much confidence as you can, to be perfect, so that you can have access to as much opportunity as possible. These are occasional activities, they're isolated uh, in their occurrence, you engage in them uh, in secure environments as an individual, um, and you get out of it a single score that determines some opportunity. By contrast, learning is very different. With learning, the purpose is to change your ability. So you're actually focusing on finding areas of failure, looking for things that you don't do well, uh, finding out how to do them better, and then going on to new things that you don't do well. In that, you go through a process where it's continuous, it's cumulative, it's social uh, in its nature, and casual, uh, and it's multivariate. There are many different elements to learning uh, that you get to experience as you go through it. So if we were to nutshell these in some way, I think the, the motto of testing would be something like um, success brings opportunity. And the motto of learning is to struggle is to learn, which is a very different kind of approach. So what I'd really like to see, and what I think we have the potential for, is a, a different kind of future where they're not so separate where assessment and learning, and again, I, I want to contextualize this by, by higher stakes consequential assessment and learning, because there are many different kinds of small scale assessments that are specifically designed to integrate more, uh, more thoroughly with learning. But where assessment and learning are more heavily integrated with each other, where you have tests that don't just drop in out of the sky, knowing nothing about you uh, and seeing what you know, but where you have tests that already understand what you've been learning, how you've been progressing through your coursework, what kinds of things you've succeeded in and struggled with, and can start with some prior understanding of your educational experiences uh, so that it can use that uh, to confirm what you know instead of establishing what you know at the outset. This would allow a number of things. This would allow um, smaller tests that don't take as much time. <coughs> this would allow tests that occur more frequently and are more integrated with curriculum and learning. It would also allow for these frequent tests to be cumulative in nature and build on each other, to build a profile of you instead of just a single event that you walk away from. It also allows um, the nature of how we learn to change as well. So learning can be more deeply integrated with assessment, and through that, um, we could have some kinds of multivariate uh, additional pieces of information about your learning that we can build into the uh, learning experience itself. Fundamentally, I think that there isn't any technological reason or any um, fundamental methodological reason why we couldn't have this today. I think that the, it doesn't require a revolution in measurement or a revolution in learning theory, but it does require some changes. These could be available in a relatively near term. What I think is most needed for this kind of change to occur is really two kinds of organizations that are willing to work together. One organization that is expert in learning uh, and understands the pedagogy of learning and how to learn, who's willing to think differently about pedagogy and the learning experience to make some elements of it more like assessment. And we need an assessment organization that is willing to fundamentally rethink some of the fundamental aspects of how you go about measurement to make some of those elements more like learning. I think with both organizations willing to work together, um, we really have the potential to create something where these are much more tightly integrated. And with that, uh, I can't wait to hear from my other panelists. Hello. Is it me? Is it me? Right. There we go. Um, so yes, um, I'm uh, Charles Walls, um, and what's up on there? Keep going. There you go. Um, and I'm the founder and CEO of Zish. Um, a very brief introduction to Zish. So. We like to think of Zish as a virtual teaching assistant. So imagine you had a teaching assistant in your classroom who knew every student's state of learning in great detail, but had also been in a million other classrooms and knew exactly how different resources and activities help students progress. Wouldn't that be an amazing teaching assistant to have in your classroom with you? Well, we try and embody that in a software application, a virtual teaching assistant. And its job is to tell a teacher in classroom, in real time, which students need help, what do they need help with, and how they can help them. And we do the first bit, which students need help and what they need help with, with fun classroom team quiz games. Teachers run a 5, 10, 15 minute quiz in the classroom, students love it, it's slow stakes, it engages them, but the teacher gets real time data on a daily basis that they can use to inform their teaching. And then we've actually done exactly what 
David has described, and we take, combine that with the learning. So we take the formative assessment, and we combine that with a resource platform, so that we can actually recommend resources, and we measure how effective they are by recommending the resources that we predict will have the highest improvement on each student's individual learning. And then the final thing that we do is we aggregate all of that data um, on a daily basis for district and provincial leaders and school leaders so that every leader can see the progress of every class and school across a whole area um, on a daily basis and get early warnings of issues that they can address. So that's what we do at Zish. So we do a bit of assessment. Um, but I don't want to talk about Zish. I want to talk about the future of assessment, which is far more interesting, I think. So, you know, very much uh, leading on from what David says. I mean, you know, we know there's formative and, and summative assessment, and I assume, does everybody in the audience know the difference between formative and summative? Put your hand up if you know the difference between formative and summative. Wow. Well, formative um, is, is what uh, Dave was talking about, is what we use to inform teaching um, and help people learn. And summative is what we do um, at the end of the year, typically, um, and we do it so that universities and employers can select students and choose which students uh, to um, take on board. But um, summative assessments are archaic and flawed. The, as, as you may know, actually exams, to our knowledge, the earliest recorded use of exams was in China in around 136 BC, used to help select uh, officials by government into the Chinese government system. Um, that was more than 2,000 years ago. Um, and this picture in the background is an exam paper from 400 years ago. Um, I don't know if you guys can read it, I can't, but if you can, well done, and maybe you can answer some of the questions. But nothing has really changed in 2,000 years, despite the fact that we now have computers. So they're archaic. They're also flawed. Why are they flawed? Well, a lifetime of learning is summarized in a handful of crude grades. Right? Crude, you get a B. How can your lifetime of learning be reflect, reflected in that one single grade? It's ridiculous, isn't it? Absolutely ridiculous. But that's what we do today. And then, yeah, the second problem is that each grade is a result, typically, of performance on a single day in a single test. If I'm ill that day, I might perform badly. If the questions are on topics that I haven't revised as well as others, I might perform badly. If I, haven't, um, uh, if I happen to be born in August instead of September, I'll probably perform 2% less on an exam at 16 um, than other people. It's a bit unfair. I might fail. There are so many reasons why summative assessments are a poor way. Summative assessments are a poor way uh, to give people a grade for selection into university um, or for jobs. And why do we do that? Well, before computers, we had to summarize learning. If you were that official in 136 BC and you were trying to select your new candidates for your, for your um, uh, official positions in your government, you couldn't go through the entire learning of each one of those applicants yourself. So you needed some kind of summary to, com to compare them. You needed to summarize them as have they passed or failed? Did they get a distinction? But today, we have the tools and technology to computers to consume millions and millions of data points and make a prediction as to whether somebody will be successful in a university career or successful in a job. And people are already doing this now by using machine learning on CVs and their LinkedIn profiles to predict and measure whether people will be successful in jobs, for example. So formative data shouldn't just be used to inform teaching. It should also be used in the future for student selection. And today we use gamified formative assessment tools that can be used every day in the classroom to collect that data and build up a picture of how every student is progressing. On the right there, you can see our Quizalize game. As students answer questions correctly, they score a basket for their team. Their team is the class. And if they get it wrong, they miss. And they're playing as a team against the team controlled by the computer. So not only does formative assessment inform teachers so they can deliver better learning, but it's also a fairer and more detailed set of data to help universities and employers better select students. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So let me share with you now the uh, story of Renaissance. Um, and I'll start by saying that, uh, like some other successful uh, organizations in the education sector, 
Renaissance was also started by an angry mom. So over 30 years ago, let me in fact tell you it was in 1984 in a small town called uh, Port Edwards in uh, the Midwest in the US. So it's a town that has less than 2,000 people in it. In that town, Judy Paul felt that she is let down by the system. She thought that her children are being failed by the system in their reading challenges, in their challenge to, to, to learn read, to read. And, and the reason is that she felt that they did not develop the joy of reading that she had as a child. She also felt that they're not reading as complex uh, classics as she did at that age. So she decided to do something about that. And in her home, she sat down and she designed a program to help her children read and guide them through their reading. That became successful and it's now world known accelerated reader being used by countless of schools globally, uh, motivating 20 million children every year through their reading practice and more importantly, developing the love of reading in them. So we fast forward to today, uh, over 30 years later on. Uh, Renaissance is uh, an evolved company. It's large, it's the biggest in its space. Uh, it has a set of products uh, that uh, are in uh, practice, assessment, and analytics in the education sector, mostly focused on uh, reading and maths. Um, I thought to share with you a couple of stats from, uh, from our company just to kind of make the point around assessment. So in the, in, in, in the black boxes over there, you can see uh, right behind Charles here uh, on the left, uh, the number of assessments that were taken, star assessments, or star reading assessments that were taken since the beginning of this academic year in the US. Uh, so at three months in September, around 29 million assessments were taken uh, by those students. And on the right hand side, you will see a calculation, our calculation of the number of instructional hours saved by taking these assessments. This is just one small example of the benefit that we can get out of assessments. We believe that the way that our assessments are designed, it actually saves time. And that time is pretty significant if you look at the whole education system. Uh, Renaissance has now a global reach. It's being used by a third of uh, the schools, the K-12 schools in the US, similar numbers in the UK. In fact, in the UK, uh, uh, more than 60% of secondary schools, or high schools, uh, use Accelerated Reader and, and Renaissance solutions. Uh, globally, we're expanding very rapidly, uh, including in Asia, particularly through partnerships set of products uh, that we've got, uh, so we can split it into two. We've got the, read, the practice solutions uh, on the right hand side over there, again in, in reading and maths. On the left hand side you'll see the assessment solutions corresponding with that. Uh, we start from uh, start early literacy. This is for children just starting the journey in reading. They don't know how to read yet, they hardly know how to talk, but they, we're starting the journey with them and there's already an assessment for them. The second one is star reading used in, uh, that's the, the widely used assessment in K-12 for reading. Star Custom uh, is a solution designed for teachers so that they can put their questions or take questions from our database, a uh, bank of questions, uh, to use informative, uh, as formative as a formative tool in the classroom as they teach. And the last one is the math uh, star test for mathematics. Now below here, he, there is a new solution called the Growth Platform. This is basically something relatively innovative and this is about using the data that comes out of the assessment to inform instruction. So companies, other companies that have content link to us and uh, the STAR assessment will point out to resources in a third party uh, educational solutions. And that way we can do truly uh, personalized learning by doing assessment-driven instruction. I wanted to share with you one insight. Uh, I thought, what would we share? And uh, maybe that basic, the most basic framework. We will talk a lot about assessment here. And 
it's important for us to understand how we measure the value of assessment. And there, it's very simple, there are only two components here. The first one is information. So what information are we getting from administering a particular assessment? And we're talking about both you know, the quantity of information and the quality of information that we're getting out of administering the assessment. The second component is the cost. How much does it cost to administer an assessment? Now we can look at simple things like, how much does it cost to pay a teacher to ad administer the assessment? How much does it cost to mark the assessment? And various other things. But we can also expand that because, for example, what emotional burden are we putting on a child by administering an assessment? There's a cost there. And you take all these costs together, and you have that component. The value of assessment is higher when we get more information for lower cost. The faster cost, uh, the faster route to mastery is by having more information, lower cost. So I hope you'll find it useful as we go through this discussion here. And lastly, I'll go back to the two uh, stats that I shared with you. In the four minutes that I presented uh, the company with you, uh, 11,000, more than 11,000 assessments were taken in the US. Uh, and we saved 1,400 hours of instructions. So what it tells us is that we in the education sector have a very unique position. In a very short space of time, we can gather a lot of data and we can also do some benefit. And the question for us, and that's something that I hope we can explore here, is how can we collect that data, what can we do with it to make, to make assessments better, and what benefits can we drive out of assessments? What additional things can we do? So with that, <clears throat> I thank you all for listening, and uh, this is an opportunity for us to uh, move to the Q&A session of this panel, and I'll start with the first question to our distinguished panelists. So the first question is, Let's, let's, go, let's go back to the fundamentals of uh, student evaluation and assessment. So what are the key aspects? Uh, what are the key aspects of the, sh of the student that, should we, that we should assess as, as part of the assessment process? Would you like to start, David? Oh, sure, I'd be happy to, to share a few thoughts on that. So um, there's many different kinds of perspectives we could take on what the key aspects we need to measure in people are. And there's a, there's a traditional approach, and then I think there's an approach that, that we need in education for the future. You know, traditionally, we focus on what we might think of as fundamental skill sets, you know, things like math, fundamental literacy, um, science, things like this. And certainly, those continue to be important into the future. But I, I also think that there are a lot of additional skills that are going to be needed for the future that aren't readily addressed now. Uh, these are things that are commonly called things like 21st century skills, non-cognitive skills. These are things that are going to be necessary given the scope of change and the pace of change in society going forward. With so much new emerging technology, so many new jobs that are being created today that were totally different than the jobs of the past, we need to be prepared to prepare students to take on jobs and responsibilities in society that don't even exist yet and to solve problems that no one has even identified yet. And so, in many respects, shifting away from something where we're measuring how much people know and shifting to whether we're measuring if our education system is teaching people how to learn, and especially teaching people how to learn independently. And so this means addressing things like soft skills around uh, teamwork, around collaboration, around problem identification and resolution, um, around um, elements of being uh, able to um, do interactive uh, negotiations, communications. These are things that, that are going to be fundamentally important going forward, uh, but that we don't do much in terms of measurement or explicit education. Now. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. Thank you. Charles, what, what's your view? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, obviously, these, the, you know, these 21st century skills are a big thing. I don't think many people know how to assess them um, properly. I mean, it's quite interesting. Um, you know, as an employer, I, I employ people. The fact that people work in teams is really important. Sometimes you hire somebody who's really capable, but they're dogmatic, or they're not willing to do the grunt work, or things. So how do, how do you assess that? Universities don't assess that. Um, Google actually did a, a three-year study on, on effective and productive teams, where they looked at all sorts of different data, what makes productive and effective teams. 
Um, and after you know, all this study, all this data, hundreds of teams across various countries, they came up with their conclusion. Does anybody know what conclusion that Google came up with as the most, single most important thing um, that makes effective teams? Nobody knows. The answer was that the team like each other. So where people actually liked each other, teams were more productive and more effective. But that comes down to aspects of team working. You know, the fact that you're willing to do the grunt work, the fact that you're not dogmatic, all of these team working things. So these skills are really important to, you know, for, for employment and, and, and so on. Second one I think you mentioned was, was, was creativity. And um, Steve Wozniak was saying in his, his talk that, you know, that it's the students who have the idea of building things and experiment, you know, if they have a Raspberry Pi or, or a Lego, that they just go and try and they build things, they experiment. And every time they do that, their inventive side of them grows and expands. And that keeps on going until they get to the age of about 20, at which point they stop having this ability to sort of learn new skills and think in new ways. I don't know whether that's right, that's what Steve was saying. But that, you know, how are we teaching our students creativity and how are we assessing it? How do you assess if somebody is creative or not? So let me just give you another little final, final Google anecdote. So when I was at Google, I, into, I was the first product manager hired outside the United States. And over my four years at Google, I interviewed 700 people for a product manager position, of which we hired about 50. Um, and I used the same question for everyone. And I'm going to ask the audience all this question. So you all have to answer, I'm afraid. I'm going to, in, in 10, 15 minutes time, I'm going to ask you for your answer. So you've got a few minutes to think about it. But the question is this. There's a snail at the bottom of a 10 meter deep hole. And every day during daylight hours, the snail climbs three meters. And at dusk, the snail falls asleep and slides down two meters during the hours of darkness. So up three during daylight, and down two during darkness. So how many days does it take for the snail to get out of the hole? And I'll leave you for 10 to 15 minutes to think about that question, and we'll come back to that one a little bit later, I think. Yep. Thank you. I, th I think that's, that's, uh, that's a great challenge. Uh, I'd like to, uh, so before, I'd like to actually ask a couple more questions about, uh, about 20, 21st century skills. So for, but, but can we, can, we, can we qualify what we mean by 21st century skills? What do you think we should be assessed? What are those? Well, you know, that's, that's an interesting question because different people have different perceptions on what some of these are. You know, I think there's still a fundamental questioning and fundamental debate about what is the skill set that constitutes the kinds of skills for the 21st century. I've seen a variety of different lists of these, some relatively short, maybe four or five different kinds of skills. I've seen others that have as many as 39 on them, and then at the end of the list they say this isn't all of them. Uh, and in fact, there's, there's a current effort by the OECD um, that is responsible for the PISA program uh, for testing internationally that is uh, cataloging a lot of these skills that they anticipate are going to be needed for success in the future in globalization uh, economies. And um, that list is fairly extensive, and it includes such things as uh, a fundamental spiritual um, sense of self. <laughs> Uh, and things like this. And so one of the things that's interesting about some of these is that there are some things uh, that I think have a, a very obvious application to, say, business practices of the future, like uh, some of the things we've talked about with teamwork, um, with being able to be culturally sensitive in, in international collaborations and things like that. Others um, are more about um, uh, elements of well-being and fall into territory that hasn't traditionally been uh, the subject of formal education that's either been at home or through religious institutions or things like that. And so uh, I do think there is a fundamental question about which of these skills that are identified are essential for um, the financial success and the um, social success of people. And also I think there's a question about whose responsibility it is you know, to nurture these skills in people because we talk about this as an educational process and that applies formal education, but your first educator is your family. And so uh, one of these questions, too, is around um, how we know people are progressing uh, more holistically as well. Thank you. Uh, so just a quick question to take to a slightly different angle. We're asking, what is it that we want to measure? And we got an example of we should measure uh, also uh, 21st century skills. I would ask another question, which is, who are we measuring for? Because we've got different 
uh, stakeholders in the process. We've got school governors, uh, we've got administrators, and we've got the people in the building, the school team, the teacher. We've got the child or the individual, right? So who are we measuring? Charles. Well, I'm glad you asked me that question. Um, the, it's really interesting because, I mean, our primary product is measuring to help the teacher personalize their teaching to the students, and that's really important. You can't do that without assessment. In fact, you know, assessment is at the heart of all the things, you know, we talk about when people go into the sessions on AI, they should really be talking about assessment because that's, that, that's at the heart of it. Um, but the other thing, actually, that we do is we aggregate that daily data from the thousands of classrooms using micro tests um, for, the, for the district and provincial leaders um, to give them that daily picture of class and school progress. Um, and that's not to monitor the teachers. It's nothing to do with that. That's what they do at the end of the year at the summative test. It's so that they can identify which classes need help, what those classes need help with, and how they can help those classes. Right? We can give them that early warning when something is not going right and allow them to make that intervention, just like a teacher would do with a student. It's incredibly powerful stuff if you think about it. You know, maybe it's that teacher needs training. Maybe they should, they'll send them a training video. Right? You know, that's, a, that's an interesting point, too, because one of the fundamental questions of, of why we measure is who's going to use the measure and what are they going to use it for? And you just described something really interesting, and that is that, um, at least in the classroom setting, if you can give teachers a measure of how their students are progressing, whether in the aggregate or whether as individuals, then they, it helps empower teachers to be able to be better at their job, help them better educate students. But then part of the question, too, is, it also implies that there needs to be tools available to the teacher beyond the measure itself to help that education. And for some of these emerging skills that um, we need for the future that aren't commonly taught, maybe there is not yet a curriculum. You know, maybe there's not yet um, a set of tools for how teachers can change these kinds of, of, of abilities within students. And so you know, I see this as an ecosystem where it's not just around the assessments and it's not just around the education but it's around the interplay between the educational materials that are available, the assessments that are available, and um, how they can use those in combination to try to nurture the right kinds of, of growth and abilities within the students. So, so we, we seem to, well, the three of us agree that actually that there's a very, there needs to be a strong, stronger focus on, on the student and the teacher in the process of assessment. Would you agree that in the industry currently, it is mostly used not for these particular stakeholders. I would agree, yes. I mean, it's so largely... We need to shift. Something. We, and and that, that shift is happening. I mean, there are, you know, obviously we do stuff like this, but I think there are other companies doing, doing similar related things. And, it's, and I, I think the impact can be incredibly significant, right? Massive, right? Because, you know, technology so far hasn't really had an impact on learning, I would argue. You know, all we've done is digitize what we used to do with chalk and the blackboard and pen and paper, you know, but the, nothing's really changed. The sort of technologies that are coming out to now that are based off real-time data and assessment have the promise to radically change how we, how we teach and how students perform. So, for example, our software um, in middle schools and science in the United States are helping students achieve 8 to 10 percent improvements in state end-of-year test scores. Now, we don't like the end-of-year test scores, but they're a great measure, in our case, that our software has been effective at helping teachers to personalize their teaching and helping students progress better. There's actually another really important po point. Teachers using our software are telling us that they're enjoying teaching again. All over the world, teachers are getting burnt out and stressed by the pressures of teaching. But what we're allowing them to do is to personalize their teaching, to use that assessment data, to personalize their teaching, they're sa we're saving them time, and they're being able to deliver the right teaching to the right student. They're seeing those students progressing, students that were failing before, and they find that incredibly rewarding. So I think we can really see, finally start to see, when we start combining assessment and learning into one, the really radical impacts that education technology can really have and has so far been lacking. So I'd like to, I'd like to move from that, and actually, let's, let's try and dig further uh, with... with uh, in, in technical ways uh, into the space of assessment and just to clarify the differences between the assessment types. Because it, feel like the, it feels like there is still confusion in the education sector. 
what, what assessment actually does and what are the different types of assessment. And that confusion feeds all sorts of negative feelings about assessments for the wrong reasons. I mean, there, there should be some, but that for the wrong reasons. There is also a growing movement, uh, opt-out movement in the US, uh, parents uh, basically taking the children out of the assessment system, partly because of that. So you touched on that in your presentation, describing the differences between formative assessment used in the classroom to summative assessment used to evaluate the knowledge of a student. Uh, let's, let's expand that to three. So we've got formative assess assessment, interim, and, uh, and, and summative. Would you like to, first of all, give us a definition of that and then tell us where would you use what? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to sort of take a stab at that. And, and you know, fundamentally, when you think about assessment in, in its broadest sense, um, you know, I, I contrasted um, formal tests you know, with education as two distinct things because often they are treated that way, especially for tests around um, decision making for graduation or for admissions or things like that, which are some of the more consequential tests. But really, assessment or understanding what someone knows is part of a continuum. And teachers, if you have a tutor, a tutor is doing that constantly. They're constantly sort of giving you small tests, small little assessments of what you know and what you don't know, finding out what you know. For the things that you don't seem to know well, they then immediately reinforce that with educational components, and then they go on and, and continue to probe and explore. So fundamentally, teaching itself is a process of iteratively assessing and teaching and assessing and teaching. So that's one end of the continuum. And then you can imagine that because teachers are not just tutors, teachers have large classrooms oftentimes to work with, that um, when we're talking about classroom formative assessment, we're talking about <laughs> equipping teachers with tools that the students can interact with independently of the teacher to demonstrate some of that um, fine-grained knowledge around specific elements that they're trying to master. The teacher can look at some summary or aggregation of that and have some ability to take some action with that student either that day uh, or over that week, over the course of that, that particular um, educational period. So that's what I think of when I think of formative assessment. We're really talking about assessment tools that teachers can use in the classroom that help them and help the students progress through their learning. The next stage up in that in this continuum is uh, what we refer to commonly as interim assessment. These are assessments that, that occur periodically. Sometimes it might be once a month, sometimes it might be a couple of times over the course of a semester or a period, but they're really sort of stakes in the ground with regard to how well students are progressing overall towards a set of goals that are longer term goals. So they're really progress indicators of a broader set of goals rather than fine grained goals uh, that usually roll up into something much more like these summative assessments, uh, where the summative assessments are often used to determine have you mastered all the material you're expected to master to, for example, pass the fifth grade uh, or to uh, graduate you know, from high school in the United States. And so these interim assessments give you a feel for how well your students are progressing towards eventual success and the summative assessments will be able to go on to some milestone in life. And, and so I put that out there as some way to, to put some stakes on this continuum. I think that, that's very useful. So the next question is to Charles, going back to your slides again. Uh, and we know, we all know that summative assessments is where the emotional burden is the highest and where the greater you know, bone of contention is around summative assessment. You describe that as you know, one event in time that determines whether somebody's successful or not. Uh, and we know uh, how much pressure it puts on, on students, which is why there's so much uh, debate around this. So are you saying that we should get rid of summative assessments? How and why and what are we going to do without that? That, that is what I'm saying, but I've been deliberately provocative. Um, so yes, I'm saying we should get rid of summative assessments. We sh with the formative data really should be far more in informative to student selection than the summative data. But there are some interesting questions about, um, you know, what other roles does the summative have? So for example, let's say we did uh, you know, remove all summative assessments as just formative. Maybe, maybe a little bit of stress is good for the student. Maybe it gives them the motivation to learn. If you completely remove all the summative, so it's just formative and you're helping students learn, does that remove a lot of the stress and the pressure or you know, actually hinder learning? Does it remove that motivation? Maybe it does. So there are other factors that come into play. But um, you know, my, my basic proposition would be that students can learn a lot faster in the classroom 
if teachers have the right data and the right tools to personalize and differentiate their teaching in the classroom, and that actually that's better, to, better done not under pressure because the student has an enjoyment of their subject and a love of learning and that they choose to learn rather than because they feel the pressure of a summative test coming up at the end of the year. So David, you do some summative tests as well. Do you agree with that? We've done a few summative tests. <laughs> so um, in essence, one of the fundamental things I do agree with actually is the idea of in a perfect world, we really wouldn't have a distinction between testing and learning. And in fact, you know, at ETS, for a period of about 12 years, we had a research agenda that was focused on integrating assessments and learning. It was called cognitively based assessment of, for, and as learning. And the idea behind this is that tests themselves uh, are academically um, educational experiences, that if we design them well enough, that the act of taking the test could be educational itself, um, that the test, if you create it well, it could be a test worth teaching to, so that you don't take time out from your educational experiences to take a test. It's integrated into the educational experiences and seamlessly uh, to the point where you can get information about their performance, but you can also use it as a learning experience itself. The, the experience was, was aspirational. Uh, There's something that we certainly wanted to do and something I would still like to see proceed. That particular line of research um, became difficult to maintain and scale because the kinds of things that are, are valuable and engaging at, at the classroom level are oftentimes very burdensome to score. Uh, they take a long time to administer. Um, and the kinds of scores that you can get out of them sometimes d doesn't uh, expand as much outward as you would hope you know, beyond um, the, the kinds of scores you get from traditional tests. So it's something that we're actively interested in. And so in spirit, uh, I agree entirely. I think there are a number of practicalities that we haven't yet been able to overcome. Uh, and this comes down to aspects of the distinction between assessments and learning. In that um, if in a, in a world where you're tracking every single behavior that someone does, and then eventually you're gonna use that for an important decision, like uh, something that's as life-changing as getting into college or not, or getting a job or not, then as soon as you, as a participant, know that the actions you're undertaking are going to be used, uh, whether in whole or in part, to make a very important life decision. You put everything you can into doing the best you can with that. As long as it's completely aligned with education, that can be great and encouraging, because if you're truly trying to be uh, as educated as possible and achieve those, that can be good. But one part of education that is important is that in, in education, you want to give students the opportunity and the freedom to explore and fail. And you want to encourage them to explore and fail. Because by exploring and failing, you learn. And you learn to do better. And you learn what things you're good at and what things you're, that you're less good at. And it helps you shape your direction in life. Because not everyone is equally masterful in everything from engineering to literature. Uh, and so you don't want to take those kinds of explorations where the student is learning uh, what uh, their skill sets are and exploring and, and systematically failing but in productive ways and hold that against them. Uh, and you also don't want to discourage them from, from you know, taking those kinds of risks. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think those are some of the dilemmas we'd have to wrestle with, with a truly integrated education assessment for high stakes. Now, I draw that distinction between that and education in the or assessment in the classroom that helps modify and make those kinds of decisions between the teacher and the student. Yeah, but it, it feels like we are kind of agreeing between us that uh, the move towards more formative or at least interim assessment is probably a good idea. And you described before the, uh, one of the problems that we've got is that we've got this wall, you had the, the Great Wall of China, <laughs> between, between assessment and between instruction. And we'll, and we'll add another thing to that, which is we're all obsessed about data. We're all collecting data, analyzing it, and trying to figure it out. And there's one space where there are, that's maybe an opportunity or a challenge, but there's one space in the education sector so there's vast amounts of data that is not, we're not collecting. And that's in the classroom. Lots of data is being lost in the classroom during the educational activity. So how, you know, the question is, and maybe, uh, Charles, you can start, but I'll, I'll give you my view. I think that I, just before we, you know, I'll, I'll hand it over to you. I'll, I think that one of the challenges is that we are not, well, the three. One, we're not training teachers to assess. They're trained to teach, they're not trained to assess, and that's a skill in itself. The second thing is that 
teachers struggle with writing discriminating items. And for the audience, discriminating items are those questions that can tell us if the student knows or doesn't know a particular thing. So discriminating question is a skill in itself, how to write them. And teachers aren't trained to do that. The third thing, and maybe we're changing it, is that we don't have the technology in our classrooms now to collect that data and then use it. So what are, what are your thoughts? You're doing some interesting things there. Yeah, I'm a, you know, I, I think we should be collecting a lot more data in the classroom. And, and, and one of the things I love about um, gamified quizzes in the classroom um, is not, we don't do it because it's fun. That's not kind of like the big thing. It's because it allows you to test frequently and often every day and the kids still enjoy it. You know, you, there's a limit on how often you can do a pen and paper test. But when it's a game, the kids actually look forward to it. You know, they actually come into school, you know, enjoying the idea that they're going to play this quiz game. I mean, it's like playing who wants to be a millionaire, for example. You know, who wouldn't want to play that at school? But it gives a teacher really rich data. But, if I may, because we're running out of time, I think we should return to the audience and see how they're doing with my Google interview question. So, um, so the first one, has, 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 has everybody come up with their answer for how many days it takes the snail to get out the hole? Is there anybody, put your hand up if you haven't got an answer yet. Now you see, nobody put the hand up, and this is like a teacher teaching in a classroom. Who hasn't understood? And nobody puts a hand up. That's one of the ways education technology can help, because, you know, if it's a fun quiz game, if I'd actually done it as a fun quiz game, maybe some of you would have given me the true answer to that question. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you five or six potential answers, and I want you to put your hand up um, if I say your answer, okay? So um, who thinks it's 11 days? Put your hand up. And no following the crowd here. Be, be honest, put your hand up. Right, who thinks it's 10 days? Who thinks it's nine days? Who thinks it's eight days? Who thinks it's seven days? Okay, that's only, are you sure you've all got your answers? What else have we got? Has anybody got any other answers they want to give? Sorry? Eight days, okay. Did anybody come up with 7.5? Did anybody come up with 7.75? Did anybody come up with 8.3? You see, the purpose of this question isn't anything to do with how many days it takes for the snail to get the hole. It's to understand your assumptions. You know, whether you have those creative thinking processes around what are the assumptions that you made, right? Where did you take your time zero? Did you take it at dawn on the first day or did you take it at midnight on the first day? What was your assumption when the snail got to the edge of the hole? Did he climb out or did he fall back down again? Did he fall asleep? In which case, it's going to be 8 point something. Is it going to be 8.3? Well, that depends on whether the snail is traveling at constant velocity. Maybe he's really energetic first thing in the morning and goes really fast. Maybe he's actually really slow and he warms up as the day goes on. So those are all the assumptions that, you know, go on in your mind. Are you able to crystallize your assumptions and understand all the different things that are going on? So that's what that question is really about. It's understanding people's thought process and ability to think creatively around the problem. So that's what I was assessing you guys on. <laughs> um, if you want a job at Google, come to me afterwards and I'll give you another question. <laughs> 21st century schools. Yeah, indeed. Well, we, he asked us the same question and we struggled too, so don't feel too bad about that. Um, so maybe we've got time for one last question. We've got less than two minutes. But uh, um, David, you described before, you know, the need to work on the difficulty of the question. We all know that we shouldn't waste people's time on asking too easy questions in a test because it doesn't tell us about anything about the student. We shouldn't ask too difficult questions that the student fails because that, again, doesn't tell us. It's at the edge of performance where we can really learn about the student. What is, what are the best uh, ways of getting to assessing in that uh, edge of performance? Well, uh, there, there's a couple of things. One of which is fundamentally knowing the student. And that's part of why, you know, in a perfect world, I'd want to move away from high stakes assessments or these kind of assessments that start with no knowledge of the person sitting in front of them, just tabula rasa and trying to measure them completely. I think we would really benefit if we could um, go and start with some prior knowledge uh, and then shape the questions towards where they stand. And I, and, I, and I do know that we're very short of time, so uh, in the, in the, I don't want to steal if you have any, any last thing to say, but I just want to also say that um, um, there's a lot of different psychometric methods we could use uh, to do that, but the fundamental principle is the same. Uh, sorry, what was the very specific question? 
Uh, what, what is the best way to get to the edge of uh, performance? Oh, okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I just think we're, we're in a very exciting time of assessment. You know, there's, there's, you know, there's not as many people in this room when somebody has a talk about AI, but actually, we, we, you know, the stuff that's happening now is going to transform education over the next five to ten years. Um, and I, I really think we're going to see massive changes in how students perform. At the moment, it's only those students who really have the dedication themselves to go outside of school and do adaptive programs that benefit from that kind of thing, and most people give up. But if you can start applying these techniques in the classroom, it can be really transformative. Thank you very much. So it looks like we run out of time. Thank you all for listening. Uh, it feels like we've only touched the tip of the iceberg here. There's still a lot more to discuss. If you have any questions, do feel free to uh, come and ask us. Uh, I thank the uh, panelists for their participation and wisdom. Thank you.